Well, welcome to Missional Discipleship. I'm Justin Meyer, uh, the Church Expansion Strategist for the Churches of God General Conference, and I'm here uh, with Reggie McNeil, who's going to lead our class. Reggie, thanks for coming, and I'm uh, glad to be take, here. take it away. Cool deal. What is this class on? Missional Discipleship. Oh, good. That way I know what to talk about. Uh, and I, we have friends here and some people who won't be friends long uh, who are uh, just joining us and giving us some uh, much-needed uh, crowd uh, participation. But you are uh, you're in for a treat, I think, because of some of the stuff I've said, which is fabulous. Uh, it's going to be even more fabulous when, of course, you have a chance to, to make it your own and, and you do something that, that really matters in terms of the kingdom of God. Uh, you know, discipleship is a word that we toss around in, uh, in church circles, and, uh, and, and a lot of times I think it's, it's given to more of a program approach so that people are curriculum-driven and they're process-driven and they're just kind of consumed with doing a lot of stuff. That's not I'm, what I'm going to be talking about in our course in terms of discipleship. I'm going to talk about what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus uh, in this day that we're alive. In fact, I suggest that you cannot work out your discipleship uh, on church property. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, it's impossible uh, to be a follower of Jesus just constricted to church stuff in church time because if Jesus, in fact, is out there calling us out to play, then uh, our discipleship gets worked out primarily in the, uh, every crack and crevice of our lives. Uh, in, in, you know, at home and at the office, in our neighborhood, at the club, uh, wherever it is that we're hanging out in restaurants, wh whatever, wherever it is we are, that's where discipleship is being worked out. Now, I think, too, to set us up for missional discipleship, uh, we have to think, which is kind of a redu redundant term. It's kind of like missional church is a redundant term, really. Uh, but I understand why we have to, to con uh, contextualize it these days in our discussion. I want to give you some background for what, uh, the, what missional church uh, it, uh, means, at least to me. Uh, it's the frame of reference that I'm using, and, uh, and maybe that will help uh, clarify some of the statements uh, and, and suggestions that I make on down the way about being a disciple. So here's, here's what missional church means, and we're going to take uh, the next two sessions, this session and the next session, uh, to talk about what the missional church is and then we're going to take uh, a session to talk about uh, how we create a people development culture which in fact is what I have in mind when I use the word discipleship because I happen to think disciples are people almost all of the disciples I've run into have been people so far and so I like to think about people development because that kind of gets us out of that program mindset, out of that church-centric, uh, church real estate, church program mindset, and moves the, the discipleship out to a larger context, which is life. And then, uh, and after we talk in a session, about, if you stay with the course that long, starting about session four then, I'm gonna talk about if, if uh, we're gonna be developing as people, you know, how, how does God prepare us for this mission trip that we call life? And, um, and that really is how missional disciples view life. They view life as a mission trip. We don't, we don't go on mission trips, you know, two weeks to Uzbekistan or somewhere and, and kind of check that off as, as some kind of activity. We view every part of our lives as an expression of mission. And then uh, on, on down the way in the course, and you'll notice that I don't change clothes for weeks. Uh, and, and on down the way uh, into the, to the course, uh, we're going to talk about um, how uh, some specific disciplines. Now, don't worry. Just relax. Look at me. Disciplines, really? I mean, so I'm not going to be asking you to eat glass or, or you know, uh, live naked under a bridge for a year or something like that or, or give up food. I don't believe in that. Um, I, I've decided I can fast quicker than most people. I can kind of get it done between meals. So I, I would expect you to, to prosecute all of these standard discipling uh, disciplines. But I want to talk about some personal disciplines that will help you move forward in your whole people development process. So if you stay with us that long, and I hope you do because you should have paid by now, and, and we're not refunding your money. I don't care how much you don't like this. 
so if you, if, if, if you stay with us that long, by the end of our 12 sessions, holy cow, 12, one for each apostle, uh, then we will uh, actually have, uh, and it's okay for you all to enjoy this for crying out loud, I'm sick and tired <laughs> of you sitting there like bumps on a log. Uh, these people out there are cracking up. They've had to go, you know, change clothes and here y'all. So, so um, what was I saying? Can you remind me? Um, so uh, at the end of 12 sessions, we will have looked at missional church, then how you get prepared for this thing uh, called life, and then some specific uh, areas of exploration. But let's talk about missional church. Have I, have I brought that up yet? Uh, and, uh, and actually, I think it's important that... Uh, that you, you challenge anyone that you're reading uh, or talking with about when they start talking about missional because missional is just such a, it's such a word now that's being bandied about by everyone. Uh, I mean, if you want to get published today, you, you really need missional in your title, like missional dog grooming or, or, or something like that because, I mean, it's like it's the thing. The problem with something when it becomes the thing is often it can become nothing because then everyone's just using it as a label to slap on whatever it is. But I think there's some very particular content and uh, some particular ideas. And, and there are four phrases that for me help delve into and kind of help open up, pop open the whole missional church expression. And, and here's what I mean by it. It's uh, the missional church is the people of God partnering with him in his redemptive mission and, and if you can't read this uh, on the screen don't worry these people right here can't read it either so you're not behind uh, just I'll just keep saying it, the people of God partnering with him in his redemptive mission in the world and I want to consider with you uh, why, uh, why each of these phrases is critical and why it sets the, the, the background, really, the context for discipleship that calls us to a different arena of play than sometimes we think about in terms of discipleship. But let's, just, let's start with the first phrase, which would be a, a typical approach. Um, and that is, you know, uh, the, the missional church is the people of God. Now, I want to tell you, I didn't grow up with this notion of church as the people of God. You know, I grew up uh, in the Western church, like probably many of you, with, you know, here's the church, here's the steeple, open the church, and here's the We didn't get to the people till we got past the church and the steeple. And, and so it, it, it's kind of a, an intriguing uh, notion to actually bring this this church idea down to or an organic notion where people actually enter the equation instead of this institutional um, kind of idea that I grew up with where church was something out there. Church was something on the corner of 3rd and Main. Church was something that we, uh, we uh, secured leaders for to manage it so we could gripe about their decisions and song choices and coffee selections. Uh, and um, church was a, a, a kind of uh, a, a organization I was supposed to write checks to and make sure that, that I attend and I'm supposed to invite people to it. All that stuff that I grew up with. So church was something out here. And, and I can tell you that that idea of church is so non-biblical uh, that, that people from the first century if suddenly transported in here would have a very difficult time of seeing what we've done to it. In fact, uh, someone sent me a manuscript just last night, uh, and I can't use their name or the title of the manuscript because I'm in the process of having them taken out so that I can uh, publish the manuscript under my own name. Uh, it's, that, it's that good, but it's, it's, it, it, it's, it, it, it's about the, the, the death of this institution uh, that we call church that's going on all around us, this institutional notion that really is going to give rise to the life uh, of the Christian movement again. Now, by the way, in other parts of the world, this is not nearly the challenge that it is for us here in the West. I mean, in China, uh, where the, the church is viral, in India, where the church is viral, 
uh, where there's a church breaking out everywhere that people can gather. In those settings, uh, they're not struggling with the institutional notion of church that we have. So they're not having to deconstruct 1,700 years of congregational uh, life form uh, as the idea of church. And so, uh, so you and I, uh, if we're going to be missional followers of Jesus, have somehow got to expand that we've got to be done with that old notion or else we're going to keep shrink wrapping our idea of discipleship uh, down to some kind of institutional setting and institutional expression. To think about the church being the people of God, uh, an organic notion, uh, is to think primarily in terms of relationship. And after all, uh, discipling, following Jesus, kind of implies a relationship to begin with. It's just interesting how we've unhooked discipleship from the person of Jesus and doing what Jesus does, where Jesus does it, when Jesus does it. But I won't talk about that, right? But so, so this notion of organic, uh, it, it's kind of like this. Uh, everywhere I am in the world, 24-7, no matter what the setting, no matter what time zone I'm in, uh, no matter what the conversation's about or what I'm doing, I am always Kathy McNeil's husband. Every minute of every day. Now, that's not a burden. It's more of a burden for her. But uh, for me, it's, it's kind of uh, nice. Uh, but the, you see, she's informing my, de, my conversation, even if she doesn't come up in our conversation. Uh, even if uh, she's not, in fact, you can't know me completely or fully, and I don't know that you want to, you probably are safe behind that computer screen. That's as close as you ever want to get, I'm pretty sure. But you can't really know me if you don't know Kathy, because she is so much a part of my life uh, after 31 years that, uh, you know, I, I just kind of live out my life in the context of that bond, that relationship. Well, the truth is, if you're a missional follower of Jesus, people can't really know you completely unless they know Jesus even, because he's so much a part of your life that you can't be understood outside of that relationship, outside of that bond, because who you are is, is coming to be and finding expression uh, as you, uh, as you, uh, you know, are, are in that relationship with him. That's what I mean by an organic relationship that colors everything we are. Now, what that means is for missional followers of Jesus, that means that we don't see church as a thing out there. Church, I'm the church, you know. You're the church. Now, you're not all the church. I'm not all the church. I mean, the church is certainly uh, bigger than any of us uh, in individually, but, but everywhere I am, the church is. This is a critical idea of discipleship. If you want to think in terms of a missional disciple, that is a huge difference in the kind of discipleship we're talking about because it's not a set of activities or a process or something out here that you're doing is discipleship. Mm -mm. It's becoming who you are is discipleship. It's becoming the person that God had in mind when he made you uh, that that is is the whole process of I mean, you can't separate your spiritual pursuits from your pursuit of being a good husband or wife or or parent or, or child or or you know lover or whatever it is whatever relation employee whatever relationship that you're all those relationships everything that you are part of then that that's how this following Jesus thing is working out. It's 24-7. And that means that we think of, of church, missional followers of Jesus, more as a verb, not a noun. We think of church as something we are. It's a way of being in the world. We church our way through life. So we church in the neighborhood. We church at our office. We church at home. Uh, we church at church. It's okay there. Uh, in fact, it might be good. Uh, we, we church uh, in our health clubs, we, we church in our leisure, because everywhere we are, it's like, to, you know, I, I'm Kathy's husband in all of those venues, everything I'm doing, I am a follower of Jesus in all of those venues, everything I'm doing, because that's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. We are organically connected to him. It is a, the central relationship of our life 
that gives meaning to our life and helps us to understand the rest of the world uh, that's happening around us. It's the filter, it's, but it's also the platform. And so all of those, all of the, that is involved when I talk about the missional church being the people of God. Now, by the way, I didn't just invent that phrase, of course. It is a, it is a biblical notion. Uh, it's, uh, it's actually a biblical phrase. And we get the people of God when God makes a decision to, uh, to, to form a special relationship with an Aramean chieftain, uh, of course, that we know as Abraham. And at that point in Genesis 12, where God cuts the deal with Abe uh, and uh, runs the card through the reader, he forms a covenant relationship that is, becomes the basis then of the meta narrative of what we call the Bible. And we have stepped into that meta narrative because the people of God, from Abraham to Israel, now to the church, Paul makes this very uh, plain, we have stepped into that meta narrative as this ongoing uh, um, expression of a special relationship that God has decided. Now, the specialness of the relationship has certain privileges, but it is certainly is mostly about a specific assignment and a covenant. And we're going to come back and talk about that in the next session. If you come back, we'll talk about it, because uh, I'll be talking about it. Uh, and, and it's about what there's a content to what it means to be the people of God, and it's very specific. It's not left... Uh, for us to decide what it is. The, what it means to be the people of God is to be people of blessing. Because that's the deal that God cut with Abraham. Abraham, I'm going to bless you. You can go look it up, Genesis 12, uh, verses 1 and 2. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make your name great. I'm going to exalt you. Now, Abe, here's your part of the deal. You are going to turn around and you're going to bless the rest of the world. See, because I've decided this is God speaking, and I speak for him a lot because, you know, it's what us spiritual leaders do. Uh, but, but, you know, apparently God made the decision that um, he, he, the best way to reflect his heart to people, uh, I mean, he could have donkeys or camels or whatever the caravan uh, and, or hand them to one of their kids, of course, carry this for us, and they would t go to the new place, and then they would unroll, and they would set up their gods. It's a fascinating story in Abraham. It's a reversal of that where God comes to Abraham and says, I'm fixing to pack you up. I'm going to roll you up in a blank. I'm going to take you to a place. I'm going to set you up, a place I'm already at. And this was a profoundly different view of God that just enlarged, enormously enlarged the whole notion. In fact, it's, it's, it's a remarkable thing that this Aramean chieftain gives to the world, this idea of monotheism of a God who's in, in uh, you know, not, not just local deity. And so, uh, and so God decided he would, uh, he would put his heart in people to bless the world. Of course, ultimately, the biggest expression of that is the incarnation itself, where spirit and flesh, you know, uh, uh, you know mesh in, in Jesus. And, uh, and you have then this, this ultimate expression of God blessing the world through the release of the redemption that Jesus works on the cross, the release from oppression to life, the release from slavery to purpose, the release from. I mean, there's, there's such, we have made such a big deal, and appropriately, of course, of what the cross does, but there, it, the cross is, a, is kind of the passageway. It's a through, it's not the point. It is a, it is a through point. You, we are released, we're, we're moving in freedom from something, slavery. This is why the big Old Testament story is Exodus, the release of slaves from bondage to their life. Uh, the New Testament uh, big story is the cross. It's, it's from, but it's to. And so we're going to be giving a lot of uh, attention in our discussion of becoming a person, becoming a disciple, becoming a missional follower of Jesus. What have we been released to become? What is the freedom for? And, uh, and, and I think that that's a really uh, an important notion uh, from, um, that, that we need to grab hold of because that's the really big story of the kingdom. Uh, because the kingdom is the larger story against the, uh, that frames the story of the church that's going on inside of it. And by the way, I will tell you that church, of course, is, is uh, not the fourth member of the Trinity 
Uh, it's not an eternal thing. I mean, the, the church, we start the Bible in a garden with no church. We end the Bible in a city where there's no church. So the church has a beginning point. It has an ending point. We have a specific assignment. And that is, as I'm suggesting, as the people of God, is to bless the world. That's our job. I will tell you that is not the job I thought growing up. Uh, the tribe I was in, uh, we had some other assignments, but I'll come back to that. But if when we are being the people of God, living up to our covenant, that's what we are. Now, let me just touch lightly on these other phrases, and then maybe uh, in the next session, should you come back. And there's a $1,000 rebate for one of you special people that come back uh, for the next online course. Um, and Justin Meyer will be writing that check. It'll be a personal check. It may s kind of surprise you, but uh, anyway, so you just watch for that. Uh, it's a code that you'll get uh, somewhere. I mean, anyway, but, but so we are, God, so God creates a people, and we, uh, we're, we are actually deployed as partners with him. You see, it's his mission. It's not ours. We didn't create this kingdom narrative. We were just brought into it. We were recruited to come onto this stage that was already set, uh, where the, the drama line, the storyline, the, the cast down had already been, uh, you know, had been set up. I mean, this was a drama, this clash of kingdoms, darkness and light and all. This is a drama that way precedes the show, the, the arrival of human beings, first of all, and certainly, the mission of God had been underway for centuries before we, you know, from the garden. I mean, we get this very clearly uh, in, the, in the story in the garden where God comes in, you know, looking for Adam. Now, you know, no one really thinks that God lost Adam, uh, you know, that he misplaced his only uh, career. I mean, I mean, what kind of God would be that bungling, you know? I mean, besides, he had a chip in Adam. So he could keep up with him. I mean, this is, you know, that whole image of God beacon thing. So, so you know, uh, but, but God puts that story in Scripture so that we get the truth that he is always the seeker. He's the one that's coming after us. He's the one that is on mission. Psst, Adam, where are you? Come on, we got to talk, you know. So that, that and, and the rest of our lives, in fact, every one of your stories, my story, is, is involved in that story because God came looking for us when we didn't even know we were hidden. We didn't even know we were in bondage. We didn't even know what we needed to be released from, you know, to, or certainly had no idea how we would get there through the cross, but he's made sure of that. So he is a God that's on mission and he's invited us out to be partners with him. Because, by the way, not because God can't pull it off by himself, he did really well for centuries before we showed up. I just think it's more fun for him uh, to do it this way. Uh, you know, he, he just, he wants people in the, in the room or on the ground that when he shows up and shows off, which is a big part of, of God, it's, it's his thing. I mean, it's, it goes with a God assignment, show up and show off. And, and so when he does that, he wants people around that go, you know, Way to go, God. That's good. Because other people are mystified. They don't know why something powerful just happened. They don't know why uh, the world order was reinvented or why good came out of evil. They don't know that. But you and I know that if we're connected with God. So we turn to him and say, way to go. And he's a glory hound. And so he wants to put people around that are going like this all the time. I mean, read the scripture. Back when there's no one else even to tell him what a good job he's doing, he tells himself what a good job he's doing. You know, there was even in the morning, the first he said that, that that was good. You know, I mean, and, and and that was really good. I mean, so so he he's he's just that kind of God. And when he's got a bunch of admirers like you and me around, where we're just absolutely swooning over what he does. He just loves. It. I mean, he's got a billion. Of, I don't know how many angels can stand on the head of a pen or whatever. But he's got a bunch of them screaming at him the whole time. What a great God he is. So so the point is, you and I are always looking for God sightings. And so that we can reflect that to him and say, you know, that's really good work today. And so his redemptive mission is the mission that was underway from the garden that he's invited us into. It's his mission. The church doesn't have a mission. The mission has a church. And that changes everything. 
uh, and uh, because the mission will uh, is, is the point. The church is not the point. You see, I grew up thinking that the church was God's mission, that building the church was what God was really up to. No, um, the kingdom is the larger meta narrative. That's the frame. That's the, that's the large piece that we've been involved in. That's why Jesus talks about kingdom of God. Uh, look at all the gospels. Jesus comes on the scene, not talking about the church, not talking about what he intends to do with the church. The church is not the point. It's the kingdom of God. That, that is the point. Thy kingdom come, not thy church come. Uh, and he says, I've, not, I've come to give you life. That's that freedom from to, that's the two part, freedom for life. He said, I've come to give you church and give it to you more abundantly. But the point is, we have this, uh, if we understand all this as the church, then we become a threshold or an entry point for folks into this large redemptive mission that God has. And that mission is redemptive, meaning that everything that sin broke, that uh, the, uh, God is up to repair. Uh, everything that sin diminished with the entrance, with its entrance into the world, it disrupted everything. It disrupted my relationship with God, but it also disrupted my relationship with myself. I mean, we talk to, uh, to ourselves about ourselves all day long, and we are at war with ourselves all day long, and we are trying to talk ourselves off the ledge or talk ourselves out of the refrigerator or talk ourselves uh, into being more kind or talk ourselves, you know, because we're having this gunning, this running battle with ourselves because we're, we're broken, and, and, and we're, we're trying to help ourselves. But what we find eventually is that we can't be the redemptive agent for ourselves because we're too much in it. So God had to come from outside and do something for us to have a way out of ourselves so that we could find ourselves. It's interesting, is a paradox. And, uh, and so the redemptive mission applies to you, to, to, to you, but it also broke our, when sin came, it broke our relationship with other people. And so that has to be repaired. It, it, it hindered, it, it diminished our relationship with the world. That has to be repaired. All of that is part of the redemptive mission of God and how, and, and the agenda for what he's doing. And then you and I, once we sign up for this and we become followers of Jesus, we realize then that that mission gets played out in the world. That's where the kingdom is manifesting. And that's why in people development that I'm going to talk about this whole course we're going to be talking about it in the backdrop of this larger world not just a shrink wrap notion of how we become disciples in a church setting well I hope you'll come back because I have to stay here and I might if, if I'm going to be here you might as well be here too so we'll see you next session thanks <laughs>